All right, hello. We're going to cover chapter one, part one in pre calculus. Let me put my window up here. All right, so this section is titled Functions. So, first of all, some definitions. Um, a set builder notation. So, we talked about sets in chapter zero, and that's uh, when you have a, more than one uh, number and you want to use that to express a mathematical idea. And there's a couple ways we do that. First of all, a uh, set builder notation is going to have an uh, open brace that curly looking parentheses here, an open brace, then we're going to state the variable, then you're going to use a large vertical line like this, and then you're going to state the constraints. So I'm just going to make one up. We'll say x is greater than 2, and then a closed bracket. So set builder notation uh, looks like this. You've got an open brace, a variable, this line, which is mathematical short, shorthand for uh, such that. So x such that x is greater than 2. And here you'll have the constraints. And here you've got a closed brace. So that's set builder notation. Now, <clears throat> set builder notation typically uses the standard inequalities here for the constraint. Interval notation is quite a bit different. So with interval notation, you've got either a parentheses um, or a bracket like this. And these are included bound, or I'm sorry, these are excluded boundaries if it's parentheses. And these are included boundaries. So if I wanted to express this same idea that I did in the first example with interval notation, I would use uh, parentheses, open parentheses, um, and then two comma infinity close parentheses. We'll do some more examples. Don't worry too much about it. So you have the starting value and then the end value in each case. And you can mix these up. So you might have one boundary excluded and one included. So you'd have one <clears throat> expressed with a parentheses and one expressed with a bracket. So a function, this is an important definition, the function. Organize my information here a little bit. Okay, so the function is when you have a, a mathematical relation. such that every domain value, talking about the x's, goes to just one range value. And of course, I'm talking about the y's there. So every x goes to just one y. And you probably remember the vertical line test draw a line vertically on a graph and if the graph ever touches two points on a straight line it's not a function so you're just testing for this with that uh, vertical line test um, does it have a single x that goes to more than one y so it's not a function so the, the predictability of a function can you be a hundred percent sure of what answer you'll get if you plug in a certain x if so it's a function if not it's not 
Okay, function notation. So this is from the work. So this time we would use the email list of 11th grade students and identify those who have completed the device screen reform on Skyward. If you have an 11th grader who needs a device and is on the list, please send it to the comments at this time. Thank you. So you'll express the function as a variable, usually a lowercase letter. So function name, name it F in this case, which is typical. And then in parentheses, you're going to state the independent variable. which is usually X, but it could be T or S or whatever. And then some expression that defines the functions in terms of the independent variable. So this will be an expression that defines the function. An independent variable is the domain value. Again, usually x. So a piecewise defined function. So that's when you have more than one expression that defines the function over portions of the domain. There we go. So you'll have some portion of the domain where one expression is valid and some portion of the domain where some other expression is valid. Here's how you do that. So you've got uh, a large open brace. So the open brace um, is going to contain all the different expressions. We'll just say uh, x, x squared, and x minus 3. So we'll say these three expressions, just chosen at random, find our function. And this is where x is less than 0. Let's say this is the case where x equals 0. This is the case where x is greater than zero. So the way piecewise defined functions are set up, you have a function a uh, equal to, and then a big open brace, and inside that open brace are however many expressions define the function. Could be two, could be three, could be four, <coughs> could be more. And then the portions of the domain over which those expressions are valid. So if you look here, x is true when x is less than zero x squared is true when x equals 0, and x minus 3 is true where x is greater than 0. So this is just chosen at random. There's some redundancy here, but hopefully you guys get the idea. Um, the relevant domain, so for a word problem, that's the portion of the domain that is actually possible. So um, this is the domain uh, you would consider for a certain problem. So the relevant domain for each of these expressions is not the entire domain. It's only the portion uh, over which they're valid, for example. So uh, it's a portion of the domain that you would consider uh, in a certain situation. And in the case of a piecewise defined function, it's the portion of the domain that the particular expression is relevant for. The dependent, dependent variable, that's uh, the range values. And again, those are typically y, not always. And implied domain, there's uh, no important distinction between relevant domains. So just implied domain, which as far as I'm concerned, is another way to say relevant domain. Okay, so this is the same chart I showed you in chapter zero, um, or a similar chart. You've got uh, only the real numbers here. We don't have the imaginaries. We're not quite there yet. But just the real number portion of that do that graph you saw in chapter zero talks about the breakdown of uh, the subsets of real numbers. Remember, there were rationals. Those can be expressed as a fraction. The irrationals can't. Now, uh, here's a little inconsistency. Do you remember in chapter zero, the irrationals were h because we used i for the imaginary numbers. Well, in this chapter, they use the other notation method and they use i for irrational. So that can be confusing if you don't uh, think about it. So using set builder notation, describe the following. A couple ways I could do this. I think a very efficient way would be to say 
uh, x such that uh, 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 7. But I cannot stop there because this would include like 2.1 and 5.5 and 6.999, which are not part of this set. So I need to also constrain myself to the uh, integers. You could use wholes or naturals, but typically uh, mathematicians use integers in this case. So I'm setting two constraints. It's between 2 and 7, including those values, and it's also an integer. So this is an, another way to say the same thing. We have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right, so that is describing a set with set builder. Now it says uh, describe x is greater than negative 17 using set builder notation. So that's going to be x such that don't forget your open brace. X is greater than negative 17. That's it. So we just wrap the inequality uh, with the set builder notation marks here. All right. <clears throat> Describe all multiples of 7 using set builder notation. Now this one's tricky because we have to introduce an additional parameter or variable. So I'm going to say x such that x equals 7 n and n is an element of the integers. So if you think about all multiples of 7, so that's negative 14, negative 7, 0, 7, 14, and so on in both directions. So if I multiply all the integers by 7, I will wind up with this list. And that's what this does mathematically. I say x equals 7 times n, where n is an element of the integers. So every possible multiple of 7 is covered by this. Okay, so here's one for you. So if you want to pause the video and try this one, and then once you have your answer, hit play, and you can check it against mine. Okay, so let me show you how to do this one. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. Now notice the difference here between the first example I did. It has an ellipsis at the end. That means it goes on forever. So that will create a little bit of a difference. The way that I would do this is x is greater than or equal to 6, and x is an element of the integers, like so. So uh, there's a couple other ways you can do it. Uh, you have the answer down here. X such that X is greater than six, equal to 6, and X is an element of the integers. So greater than or equal to, and an element of the integers. So let's go on to using interval notation. So between negative 2 and 12, including, so notice these are included boundaries. So that means we're going to use open and close brace. So open brace first value, negative 2, and then positive 12 is our last value, and close brace. So that's our answer. Interval notation is very efficient or it is applicable. X is greater than negative 4. So again, using interval notation, notice this is an excluded boundary. So we uh, have just greater than, not greater than or equal to. So this boundary is not included meaning where we have that boundary, we don't include it. And it goes on and on and on to infinity, and you never include infinity or negative infinity. Those are always excluded, because it's not really a number, it's an idea. It stands in for the biggest possible number. Okay, so interval notation. Here we have a union. When you see the word or, that indicates it's the union of two uh, inequalities. So less than 3 or greater than or equal to 54. So we're going to have to use the union symbol. Less than 3 will look like this, from negative infinity to 3. So there's that part. And then greater than or equal to 54 will be 54 like so. So 
there's our answer. Again, very efficient where it's applicable. The interval notation. All right, so here's one for you. Again, you can pause the video, do it yourself, and then come back and check your answer against mine. All right, I'm guessing you're back. And so let's do it. So greater than five or less than negative one. They kind of tried to trick you here by inverting the order. So if we go ascending, which is typical, uh, you would want to write this one first. So negative infinity to negative one, not included. And then the or symbols represented by that union. And then greater than five would look like this. All right. So a function. Remember that a function maps a domain to a range in a way where every domain element goes to exactly one element only. You can't have a single range element going two places. Now notice here they do something kind of funny. They've got two domain elements going to the same range element. That's fine. That's not an issue. As long as an individual domain element doesn't go to two places. So if this, if it were like this, that would not be a function. But this is okay. Vertical line test. You'll remember again that if a vertical line ever touches two points, the relation in question is not a function. Not a function. So identify relations that are functions. Determine whether the relation represents y as a function of x. The input value is the height of a student in inches, and the output is the number of books that that student owns. So this is really a strange question, but um, does your height uh, predict your the number of books you own? In other words, could a student that had that shared a height with another student own two different numbers of books? Of course they could. And so this is not a functional relationship. So not functional. Because, you know, I'm 5'10", uh, you know, I have a lot of books, but there might be a person that's 5'10 that owns virtually none. All right. <clears throat> Make this a little larger. Here we've got a table to analyze <clears throat> and determine functionality. So same x goes to two different y's. And then it happens again. So this is a double knot function. You got x1 uh, that goes to both negative 1 and positive 1. And you got x4 that goes to both negative 2 and positive 2. So if I were to graph those, you have positive 1 going to negative 1 and positive one going to positive one. Do you see how that would fail the vertical line test because it would hit two points and then it would happen again here. So not a function. This graph, so if I were to take a vertical line and I were to move that over the graph, it would never touch two points. Now, it, would, it might seem to you like it would get steeper and steeper, and it would, but it would never be vertical. So it would never be the case that a vertical line would hit two points. So this one is a function. And then uh, D is in delta, for example, 3. Identify relations that are functions. Determine whether x equals 3y squared. So this one is... A challenge because you probably haven't graphed y as a function or, or y as the independent variable. You know, y is what you plug in and then you find x. So this is sort of the opposite of what you would typically do. But the graph is going to look like this. And you'll see that would fail the vertical line test miserably. So that's not a function. And one way you can graph these on your calculator is to solve for y. So I would divide by 3 and then use the square root property. And you'd have to list this as, as both the positive and the negative. Like so. so that would give you a graph like this. And you'd see that it's not a function. 
Okay, 12x squared plus 4y equals 8 represents y as a function of x. So this is one for you. So pause the video, try it, and then push play, and you'll see if you're right. Okay, so um, if we solve this for y, we get uh, 4y equals 8 minus 12x squared, and then y equals 8 minus 12x squared over 4 y equals 2 minus 3x squared. So that's the graph is going to be something like uh, this, but it is going to be a function. So this is a functional relationship. The vertical line would never touch two points. So when you have an expression like this, it's, you can't tell by looking at it. You'll have to graph it, and you can graph it with your calculator. Or if you're really super familiar with the way quadratics are shaped, you can just sort of uh, make a good guess and infer from that whether it's functional or not, which is what I did. Okay, so find function values. If I have a defined function, <clears throat> in this case, x squared minus 2x minus 8, I can find those function values. So f of 3 is going to equal 3 squared minus 2 times 3 minus 8. To, so to find a function value, I just plug in whatever that uh, x value has been set as for x in the expression that defines the function, like so. So I have 9 minus 6 minus 8, so that's 3 minus 8 or negative 5. Your calculator can do this as well, so let me show you how to do that. <laughs> and I'll share my whole screen so you can see it. Okay, <clears throat> so the way you would do this on your calculator is to define the function in uh, the y equals page. So you get y equals takes you here, and we're going to plug in x squared minus 2x minus 8. Once you have that, <clears throat> you can go to the table. And you can navigate back and forth, or you can go to table set and just set it to start at the value you're interested in, in this case, 3. And it'll give you 3 is negative 5. There are other ways to do it in your calculator, but I think that's probably the most efficient. Okay. We're going to do that again, but this time, instead of a just a number, we have an expression including a variable to plug into our function. So f of three negative three d equals negative three d squared minus two times negative three d minus eight. So you remember on in chapter zero we talked about properties of exponents. So when I have an exponent over uh, a product here, each of the factors will get the exponent. So negative 3 squared, and then d squared. Negative times a negative is positive. So I have uh, positive 6d minus 8. So that's going to be positive 9. Negative 3 squared becomes positive 9. d squared plus 6d minus 8. So for problems like this, you can use online tools like Wolfram Alpha to check your answer. But I want you to try them first on your own. This is really good practice for you mathematically. If you haven't done it in a while, especially. So once again, we're on example four, part C this time. And if f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 8, find the function value for 2a minus 1. Now here we have a binomial. In other words, it's got two parts. So that's going to make our life a little more challenging. f of 2a minus 1 equals 2a minus 1 squared minus 2 times 2a minus 1 minus 8. Now, these parts are going to be pretty easy, but here we have to FOIL. So that's 2a minus 1 times 
times 2a minus 1. And then negative 2 times 2a is minus 4a. Negative 2 times negative 1 is plus 2. And then minus 8. So this is the part that's challenging here. 2a times 2a first times first is 4a squared. So that's first times first. And then outer times outer, which is 2a times negative 1. So that's going to be a negative 2a. Plus inner times inner, negative 1 times 2a once again, minus 2a. And then finally, last times last, negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. And then minus 4a plus 2 minus 8. Now we have to combine all our like terms. So 4a squared, there's only one squared term. But there's not minus 2a, minus 2a, and minus 4a. So that's minus 8a. Combine all the values of a there. And then um, <clears throat> all the constants, 1 plus 2 minus 8 is 3 minus 8, or minus 5, like so. Once again, you can use online tools like Wolfram Alpha and so forth and so on. Uh, feel free to do that to check your answers, but again, Try it first. Okay, example four, one for you. Try to find f of six, go ahead and pause the video and do that real quick. Okay, guess in your back. So f of six equals three times six minus four over six squared plus four times six plus four. Three times six is 18 minus four. Six squared is 36. 4 times 6 is 24, plus 4. So 18 minus 4 is 14, over 36 plus 24 is uh, 60, plus 4, 64. So 14 over 64 will reduce. Let me just double check myself, make sure I don't have any boo-boos. Mental arithmetic is not the most trustworthy method. So always be suspect of your arithmetic. Okay. So that's 7 over 32, I reduce, and it does not reduce further, like so. All right. Example 5, find domains algebraically. So domains for many functions are all real numbers. But sometimes they have a constraint, and this is just such a case. So the constraints that will happen on the domain at least early in this book, are going to be division by zero, negatives under a root, um, and variables to a negative power, which is another way. Because at this time, you would use a list of 10th graders, identify those who have completed their device agreement. If you have to it on the list, and then use device, you can send them to the comments at this time. So just please have a seat in the comments. Mr. Redford will help you when he's ready. Thank you. So if you see a negative exponent on a variable, that's another way that division by zero can occur. So it's really just division by zero and variables under root for now. There will be more later. You know, later on, for example, uh, logarithms can't have a negative argument. But we'll worry about those when we get to them. For now, division by zero, negatives under a root. And here we have a root, so we know we cannot have negative values under there. So because this definition involves an even index root, a square root, I know that it has to be the case that 4x minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Because you can't have an ex a negative value and uh, get a real result. That would be an imaginary result. We want to confine ourselves to real numbers when we state the domain. So I'm going to add 1 to each side. And I'm going to divide by 4. So here is my domain for this function. All right. <clears throat> Next. Finding domains algebraically, once again. Here you've got a variable in the denominator. So this is potential, uh, has potential to be division by zero. So we know that in this case, t squared minus one cannot equal zero. So that's our domain constraint. 
I add one to each side. T squared cannot equal one. Use the square root property. T cannot equal uh, plus or minus the square root of one. So T cannot equal uh, one or negative one. So those two values are off limits. So if I were to state the domain here in set builder notation, it would look like this. That's one way we can do it. <laughs> so here we've got a kind of a double way. We've got a variable under a root, but it's also a square root. Or, I'm sorry, a variable in the denominator, and it's also uh, the radicand. So we've got two things to worry about here. The first thing let's worry about is the fact that it's under a root. So that tells us that 2x minus 3 has to be greater than or equal to zero. So notice that or equal to part. And then let's think about the um, additional constraint of being in a denominator, which tells us that the square root of 2x minus 3 could never equal zero. So it's going to equal zero where this expression is zero. And you see if I put these two things together, I get 2x minus 3 has to be greater than zero. So those are Two constraints can be expressed with a single inequality here. If I add three to each side, I get this. Divide by two, I get this. So x has to be greater than three over two for this example. Okay, uh, here's one for you. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this one x squared minus 16 has to be greater than or equal to 0. x squared has to be greater than or equal to 16. So uh, x squared in an inequality like this is kind of tricky because the way uh, positives and negatives work. So if you think about uh, where this would be true, let's think about it on a number line. So negative 4 and 4. Do you see how if I plug in negative 4, I get 16, and it's true? So, in any greater value, if I put in negative 5, for example, that would be 25. It would also be true. So, everything less than negative 4 would satisfy this inequality. And then positive 4, 16, well, that's true. If I put in positive 5, 25, that's true. So, everything including that point would satisfy the inequality. So it cannot be between these. So this is the part where it would fail. Meaning we could express that a lot of different ways. Let's just do it with interval notation. So I'm going to go negative infinity to negative 4 union. And I should use a bracket here. That is included. So evaluating a piecewise defined function. So as we stated, and I don't know why they use such a convoluted example here the first time they ever show you a piecewise function. It should be simpler. But anyway, this is what we've got to work with. Um, these define uh, the function if 1,000 is less than A is less than 2,600. And this defines it if it's between 2,600 and 4,000. And this defines it if it's greater than or equal to 4,000. So these are um, square footages of um, homes in a given area. So realtors in a metropolitan area studied the average home price per square foot as a function of total square footage. Their evaluation yielded the following piecewise defined function. Find the average price per square foot per home with a square foot of 1,400 square feet. So we need to determine the relevant domain. Which of these domains does this value fall into? Well, it's the first one. It's between 1,000 and 2,600. So that means this 
is the expression we will use to define the function. So, P of 1400 is going to equal uh, 1400 minus 1000 over 40 plus 75. So that's going to be 400 over 40 plus 75. So that's 10 plus 75 <clears throat> or 85. So the average price per square foot. And this data is pretty old. This book is a dozen years old or so. This wouldn't probably be realistic today. Um, but the average price per square foot of a home with this um, square footage would be in this area, according to that formula. So 85 is our solution. Next, same thing, but this time we're talking about 3,200. So that's a big old house. It's like a five bedroom. So it's in this higher category. So in this case, P of 3,200 is going to be defined by this expression, because this is the relevant domain. So that's negative 3,200 minus 2,600 over 10, I'm sorry, over 100, plus 1, 10. So 3,200 minus 2,600, remember pen dots, you do what's in the parentheses first. So that's negative 600, no, I'm sorry, positive 600. And then when we apply the negative here, it will be. So 3,200 minus 2,600 is 600. And then multiply that by negative to get negative 600 over 100 plus 1 over 0. And so that's negative 6 plus 1, 1, 0, or about 104 dollars per square foot. Okay, moving on. So here's a different uh, piecewise defined function. Go ahead and pause the video, give it a try, and then come back and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so here we are. E of 950. I need to determine the relevant domain. Which of these is appropriate for 950? Well, it's going to be the second one. And so this expression is what's going to define the function's behavior in that uh, portion of the domain. So actually made my circle a little too big there. Let me fix that. So this is the expression. So that's going to be 10 plus 0 0.05 times 950. So that's 10 plus and then 0 0.05. According to my calculator, is 47.5. So that's going to be 57.5. This is the cost of res residential electricity use. So 950 kilowatts. I guess the electric company gives you a little discount if you use a whole big bunch in this scenario. All right. Um, so that's the end of chapter one, part one. And I'm going to give you guys a brief assignment and look it up here real quick. So what I'd like for you to do is page nine problems two through 26 even. So in your book, page nine problems two through 26 evens are right. Don't do the odds. Two, four, six, eight, and so on, up to 26. Okay, see you next time.